Okay, this is the audio review for chapter seven, Identities and Inequalities, Inequalities in Law and Justice. All right, so laws and their social construction. So when it comes to power politics and legal definitions, conflict theorists argue that the coercive power of the state tells us that laws are in our best interest. But often, laws are political instruments used by elites to further their own interests at the expense of others. To further their own interests at the expense of others. Laws are often developed by legislators that are not similar to the constituents that they serve. Today, running for office requires millions of dollars, meaning that most receive a lot of money from lobbyists or powerful, other powerful interests. This, of course, shapes what kind of policies go forward and what kind of laws are constructed in whose benefit. When it comes to laws of intimacy, not just larger criminal laws are affected by our behavior, but also laws can control our private intimate choices. For example, the state does not tell you who you are allowed to fall in love with, but marriage is also a legal contract with specific age requirements, health requirements, inheritance rules, and so on. This country has less strictures than in other countries and less than in the past, but as sociologists, we know that society is very segregated. So people tend to fall in love with or marry people that are very similar to them, you know, with, when, within race, class, religion, culture, etc. So miscegenation, right, the fear of interracial relationships, this has been a part of American culture and politics and law for about 400 years. Laws against miscegenation originated in the colonies, which developed the concept of a one-drop rule, which effectively locked people of mixed races from the hierarchy of white privilege. This has also affected our understandings of the sexuality of African Americans, where under Jim Crow, black women were not able to be raped, as only white women were able to be raped. So a woman could not even report a crime up, through, up until the civil rights era if they were sexually assaulted. So this is not long ago. Also, violent disapproval of interracial relationships and sexual contact still continued well into the 20th century. The book connects us to the murder of young Emmett Till, who was accused of flirting with a white woman and was brutally beaten, shot, and drowned, his body found in the Tallahatchie River. An all-white jury exonerated the men who were arrested for his murder. Also, I should mention that the woman that said that he winked at her um, on her deathbed said that that never actually happened. But what's important about Emmett Till is that his mother had the bravery to show what happened to him. And it was one of those moments where people galvanized around seeing this 14-year-old be utterly transformed through the beating and the drowning into an unrecognizable figure. And it was such a horrific thing that did galvanize some support for the civil rights movement. So... Legal changes to this practice of, you know, anti-miscegenation laws began in 1958 when a Virginia couple named Richard and Mildred Loving were arrested in the middle of the night for violating Virginia's law banning interracial marriage. They faced jail or the judge offered to drop that if they would just leave the state and promise to never return. So most states had explicit laws against interracial marriage, so they settled in Washington, D.C., and later appealed their conviction, and the Supreme Court eventually ruled in the case in favor of the Lovings, saying that restricting, restricting the freedom to marry was unconstitutional in 1967. The number of interracial marriages is on the upswing, which shows the acceptance of interracial marriage is increasing as well. Of course, there are still places where interracial couples face outright discrimination in their attempts to marry. Also, those in black-white relationships still receive a lot of social disapproval in their everyday lives. When it comes to same-sex marriage, this is a recent issue of the state trying to control who can be married, which finally, because of the Supreme Court objections, is now legal across all 50 states. So, 20 years ago, Americans supported the Defense of Marriage Act, which formally defined marriage as a union of one man and one woman. DOMA also authorized all states to refuse to accept same-sex marriages from states where it was legal. DOMA also denied federal benefits, such as social security, survival payments, and spousal burials in national military cemeteries to same-sex couples. It took 20 years and many states individually legalizing same-sex marriage and benefits, eventually ending at the Supreme Court ruling that legalized same-sex marriage nationwide.
Okay, moving on to race, class, and justice. Inequalities in the law can be seen most glaringly in the disproportionate amount of people of color who are incarcerated under mass incarceration and the war on drugs, which, you know, the film is going to address a bit. So issues of the state killings of various men and women of color has brought the attention to the issue of state violence and police brutality. More importantly, the Black Lives Matter movement has led protests and uprisings around the killings of unarmed people of color, bringing attention and shifting the public consciousness on these issues. As the book mentions, justice is now blind. Our social prejudices affect who we see as deviant, who's considered dangerous, all connected to the racialized history of this country that constructed people of color as animals, savage, inferior, violent, out of control, or more recent characterizations, Hoodlums, wolf packs, wilding, so many terms emerge throughout U.S. history to stigmatize racial minorities. This is an ongoing process, something we need to understand as people look at the protests and think this is a new issue. But police brutality, especially targeting communities of color, is a fundamental part of the history of policing. It's embedded. This racial hate embedded in the process of policing and the criminal justice system itself, which is why it's so hard to address and alleviate these issues. But there is hope that with more public attention and understanding of the issues brought to attention by the Black Lives Matter movement, we can find solutions and change the system to something that isn't so prejudicial. So when it comes to racial profiling, it is common for police to profile people and consider them deviant, as you'll see in the film, under claims that someone quote unquote fits the description. Race affects the way that we interpret and define each other. A culture filled with racial ideologies of crime reinforces that racial groups should be profiled instead of looking at our internalized prejudices and stereotypical assumptions. This is, again, is an ongoing issue, but it does make sense when you look at the information in the text that points out that the racial composition of police departments versus the racial composition of communities, such as finding that in hundreds of police departments across the country, the percentage of white officers on the force is more than 30 points higher than the percentage of whites in the communities that they serve. So the book points out that in Ferguson, Missouri, whites are 29% of the population, but 83% of police officers. The same situation in reverse is true. The people of color are targeted by racial profiling, so they're more, much more likely to be arrested, detained, prosecuted, convicted, and given longer sentences than white defendants. The inequalities in the criminal justice system then work cyclically as more people of color end up in prison. That leads to racialized assumptions that if more people are in prison, that they must be more criminal. When in reality, it reflects racialized policing as well as geographic hotspot policing of communities where people of color remain locked in endemic poverty due to years of whites only suburbs, redlining, globalization, deindustrialization, and denied opportunities. Some communities are hyper-policed. In many white suburban communities, youth that are stopped with possession of marijuana are let go. The marijuana is dumped out and no criminal charges are filed. While in those poor inner city communities, youth stopped with possession of marijuana are arrested, prosecuted, incarcerated, and then have to navigate the criminal justice system. Police argue that racial profiling is a crime control tactic. Statistics in the book point out how whites are more likely to have drugs, weapons, or other forms of contraband when they're stopped driving. This idea of reasonable suspicion or fitting the description is not supported by facts. It's only supported by prejudice. When it comes to class and crime, when politicians talk about fighting crime, they're typically talking about street crime, not corporate or white collar crime. The reality is many people die on the job in hazardous industry accidents, which cause much more of an effect than street crime does. So we tend to see crimes as more deviant when they correspond to the poor, who we also see as deviant. In reality, the constant and imminent physical danger to us from things that are unsafe, like unsafe work conditions or dangerous chemicals in the air, water, or food supply, faulty consumer products, unnecessary surgeries, and shoddy emergency services are just some examples of how corporate and white collar crime poses impacts to everyday Americans. So corporate and white collar crime poses much greater threats to Americans than street crime does. The FBI estimates that burglary and robbery cost the US $3.8 billion a year, while just unnecessary medical procedures alone cost at least $210 billion annually. 
and unnecessary medical procedures are just but a part of the total cost of white-collar crimes, like corporate fraud, bribery, embezzlement, insurance fraud, cell phone fraud, internet-related crimes, securities fraud, and others, which amounts to an estimated $680 billion a year. Not to mention the banksters, the people who destroyed the entire world's economy based on fraudulent speculation, tampering with interest rates, and other backhanded issues like selling adjustable rate mortgages to people and then betting against those mortgages on the stock market as the rates skyrocketed and people could no longer afford to pay their mortgages. They knew they were shitty deals and they bet against them and they made bank. There's some of those individuals like Bernie Madoff that go to jail, though I think it's important to note that Bernie Madoff actually ripped off a lot of rich people, a lot of rich, powerful people, and he went to jail. But while corporations themselves rarely receive heavy criminal punishments when their dangerous actions violate the law. So an example not given in the book, but I think is relevant, is when the bank HSBC was caught laundering money from Mexican drug cartels. They had to pay about a billion dollar fine, something that did not affect their business at all. Hardly a punishment, right? <laughs> Definitely not the punishment you or I would get. Like if you laundered money for drug cartels and the government was like, okay, you owe us a hundred dollars, <laughs> right? It's just not the same kind of criminal prosecutions. These corporations get more and more powerful as they use their money to influence politicians to create laws that unleash them on us with little consequences at least to them, large consequences to us, right? So while the Supreme Court decided that corporations are people, somehow they cannot incarcerate a corporation like they can an actual person. Okay, moving on to prisons. Politicians have long increased mass incarceration due to the desire to be quote-unquote tough on crime, which proved successful in election years, right? It was a huge tactic to get reelected, which is why um, something we talk about in my criminology class, punishment is purple, which means it's not a Democrat issue, it's not a Republican issue. For decades, it was an issue for both sides of that aisle, right? Because they saw it as an advantageous way to get reelected. It wasn't popular to say, hey, I'm going to let out criminals, right? It was popular to say, I'm going to be tough on crime. We still see that in politics today. So we do have a lot of issues with recidivism in the country, where most people who leave prison end up back there within a short period of time. But the only thing that seems to lessen recidivism when you look at, you know, studies that actually focus on how do we deal with issues of recidivism, it's educational or job training programs that give people an opportunity to find a path where they, when they leave prison, to be successful. So the war on drugs and the use of mandatory minimum sentences has dramatically changed our prison population, where now the majority of people in prison are there for nonviolent drug offenses. Of course, the racialized nature of policing contributes to this, but also other social institutions that fail those without privilege, such as education, meaning those without a high school diploma are more likely to be incarcerated, and institutions like employment. As those with low levels of education face hardships in finding jobs, and this is even more so for those who have been incarcerated, especially those with felonies who have to check the box on job applications. The war on drugs exploded the prison population, changing police focus and budgets as the years wore on. This escalation of incarceration for drug offenses has created a significant ethno-racial imbalances. Police agencies frequently target low-income minority communities for enforcement operations. While the trends are slowly changing, Blacks and Latinx populations still make up two-thirds of people in prison on drug charges. So some of these disparities are clearer when you look at how drugs themselves are linked to different groups and seen as more or less deviant as a result, such as the 100 to 1 rule, where crack cocaine was criminalized 100 times more than powder cocaine. So think to yourself, who was associated with crack cocaine? What communities? Who was and really still is associated with powder cocaine use? What specific community do you think of? Wealthy white men, right, are known for cocaine since before Freud used way too much of it. So who the drug is associated with affected how it was criminalized. So if you had five grams of crack, you got the same penalty as someone with 500 grams of cocaine. So a small bag of crack versus a suitcase of powder cocaine. In reality, all research on crack cocaine has found that whites use it more or as much as other communities, but as they were not associated with crack cocaine usage, they largely avoided arrest and imprisonment. 
in the Obama administration, they wanted to address this 100 to 1 issue, but they could only get Republicans down to 18 to 1, which in fairness is better than 100 to 1 since 18 is a lot smaller than 100, <laughs> right? But it's also not one to one as it should be since the only real difference between the two is baking soda and heat and really the racialized perceptions of who uses the drug. When it comes to race, class, and death, research on the death penalty has shown that it's not an effective deterrent. Also, when it comes to racial disparities in the system, 54% of all people in death row are Black or Latinx, which is disproportional to their percentage in the overall population. Not only that, but the race of the victim may actually have as much to do with the decision to pursue a death sentence as the race of the defendant. According to research by Amnesty International in 2013, the single most reliable predictor of whether a defendant will be sentenced to death is the race of the victim. For instance, African Americans account for almost half of all homicide victims, but the overwhelming majority of people put to death since 1976 were convicted of killing white victims. In contrast, only 15% of those executed were convicted of killing blacks and 65 involved Latinx crimes. 65% involved Latinx crimes. So this demonstrates the racial bias in who gets sentenced to life in prison and who does not. Also, part of our rights is to have a jury of our peers, but this is not necessarily a fact for many minority defendants. Racial bias also influences juries' decisions. So jurors in capital murder cases are regular people who bring their own sets of prejudgments with them. The book explores Benjamin Fleury Steiner's research examining transcripts and interviews with black and white jurors on capital murder cases, finding that jurors draw on extensive stereotypes about race to interpret the facts of the case, finding that white jurors interpreting defendants in racist ways, one calling a defendant a chained gorilla, while black jurors felt more hostility and alienation towards their fellow white jurors than the defendants. Some also describe the frustration of trying to explain to white people the realities of black life because they were trying to counter the unfair racial stereotypes of their fellow jurors that they brought with them into that examination of the case. So race does affect who we see as threatening and dangerous. And in another way, race affects who we see as worth redeeming and who we think should be executed by the state. Okay, moving on to gender justice. So throughout history, women have been denied many legal rights that men take for granted. In the 18th century, once you were married, you were no longer an individual if you were a woman. You were legal property of your husband. While the law allowed men to abuse their wives, force them to stay at home, force them to have sex without being considered rape. Some laws have addressed sex discrimination in employment, educational amendments, and Title IX, which attempt to deal with educational inequalities, and the Family Leave and Medical Act, right, or the FMLA, that allows mothers and fathers to take up to 12 weeks of unpaid sick leave to raise a child or take care of a sick relative. The problem with this is the unpaid part, right, as pretty much every other developed nation has some sort of paid family leave. Most of us cannot afford to take 12 weeks off of work with no pay, right? Obviously, California has a couple, couple weeks that it gives people paid, but um, as far as federal legislation, FMLA is all we have. So when looking at an issue in the workplace, a big one is sexual harassment, right? Even though sexual harassment laws have been enacted over 20 years ago, it's still common and prevalent to see the issue of sexual harassment in the world of work. Harassment and sexual misconduct are particularly problematic in the military. As discussed in the chapter, women are often denied, ignored, or dismissed when they bring up issues of sexual assault. And so this issue continues because commanding officers do not acknowledge the severity of these sexual assaults. And it's kind of the hierarchy itself that makes it difficult for people to kind of get justice in those systems. But feminist sociologists interpret sexual harassment as an attempt to reinforce a position of power. Also, because harassment is about power, men can also be victims. We tend to think of sexual harassment as the sexual part when it's really about domination, control, and humiliation. I think the clearest example would be the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill example, right? When she testified about the kind of treatment that she received from him. I mean, these were incredibly egregious examples of sexual harassment 
but that was not enough to keep him off the highest court in the land. And now he gets to sit on the Supreme Court and make decisions about those kind of cases themselves. I mean, not to mention the fact that Clarence Thomas was in charge of the EEOC when he was sexually harassing Anita Hill and actually another um, employee came out after as well to corroborate that she was also being sexually harassed. He would describe the kind of pornography he liked to watch. He referred to himself as Long Dong Silver. Like, these are things you cannot make up. And it, she basically got to testify before his confirmation hearing in the Senate, and then she was put on trial. There's an amazing documentary about it on Netflix called Anita that really details the horrific way in which she, her character, was assassinated. She was called, you know, all of these horrible names. And really, they drew upon racial stereotypes about Black women to denigrate her. And really, there's this whole weird thing about how she was just trying to take down a strong Black man, right? Which is actually very similar to what we heard around Bill Cosby when he was first accused. The first couple women that came out, um, you know, now there's like, what, over like 30 plus women that were on the record with these things. I mean, it's actually much more than that now. But um, the point is, is that people tend to think of it as a sexual thing. So with Clarence Thomas, they said, well, he couldn't have been sexually harassing her because he was having sex with these other women. But it's not about having sex. Like, if you want someone to have sex with you, do you humiliate them? No. This is about controlling a person. He asked her out, she said no, and then he started sexually harassing her. So it's really a retaliation, and it's really trying to show who has power, right? Who gets to use that power? Who gets to wield it against someone who has less power? So we often think of it in a sexual way, but we should really be looking at the domination, the control, the humiliation that often mars that issue of sexual harassment. All right, moving on to gender and violence. Definitions of male power are imbued with sexual aggression and physical violence. Men account for the majority of violent crimes. Yet men are also more likely than women to be the victims of violence, including assaults, robberies, homicides, but also suicides, death in military combat, and even accidental deaths from working in hazardous occupations and participating in other high-risk activities. So when looking at the intersections of poverty, gender, and human trafficking, violent victimization often crosses national boundaries. Human trafficking is an example of this violence. Estimates range from 12.3 million to 27 million adults and children are bought, sold, transported, and kept against their will. They may be forced into labor in sweatshops or become domestic servants, while others are sold into prostitution, sex tourism, or forced marriages. This is not just an international issue, as estimates have over 17,000 people trafficked into the U.S. every year. Traffickers find victims in several ways. They may offer fake job ads in places with high unemployment and poverty, or fraudulent modeling or travel agencies to lure unsuspecting victims. They target the most marginalized populations, and they use threats, intimidation, and violence to force victims to engage in sex acts or to work as slaves for the traffickers' financial gain. When looking at intimate violence, aside from trafficking, women's rates of violent victimization outpaces men in crimes closely related to their familial or sexual disadvantage, such as incest, rape, sexual assault, dating violence, and intimate partner violence. They are tied to intimacy and have been largely ignored or treated as less serious by the criminal justice system. So when it comes to rape and sexual assault, in the U.S., rape is the most frequently committed but least reported violent crime. The most common reason given by victims for not reporting is fear or retaliation. Rape and sexual assault are two of the most personal violent crimes. In studies on college campuses, 90% of women who were sexually assaulted knew their attacker. Rape is the reflection of broader patterns in gender inequality, like how women were considered property of their husbands, right? This idea that you couldn't rape your wife, which famously came up in the 2016 election when um, one of the shady lawyers for Donald Trump basically defended him from the fact that his first wife had sued him for um, spousal rape, basically saying, well, you can't rape your wife, which of course is not true at all. It's not legally true. It's not true by any definition, but it shows the kind of pre prejudicial thinking still out in the culture. 
I mean, they literally used to call it a wifely duty. It was just assumed. But even more than that, globally, rape is often used as a wartime tactic of terror or revenge, either against female victims or their male partners and families, right? To humiliate the men, you rape the women. And even, even further than that, often lesbian women are targeted, especially for rape or sexual assault around the world and in the U.S., in this attempt to fix or cure them as if that's why someone's sexual identity is what it is. But really, it's just a way to try to reinforce power systems onto a person's body. So feminist theorists argue that throughout history, men have used rape and the threat or fear of rape to exert control over women. In some cultures that are more patriarchal, women are hurt, imprisoned, or killed for being rape victims, as it's seen as bringing shame on their families. So rape myths feed into reasons why women do not report rape and reasons why offenders get away with these crimes. We look at the victims critically in order to find ways to blame them for their victimization. This is something we don't do with other crimes, right? We're not like, oh, you got robbed? Are you sure you got robbed? Are you sure you didn't just give that person your car or your watch, right? Or, well, what were you doing driving such a nice car? What did you expect? Like, we don't do that with other crimes, right? Also, race and class plays into whether we interpret a woman as a victim, right? All those other social prejudices affect who we see as victimizable and who isn't. So women learn from the societal messages that it's their responsibility to prevent rape. So women alter their behaviors and live in the shadow of rape, right? There's this activity we do in one of my classes, my gender course, we talk about this, like it's actually stolen from Jackson Cats, but that's fine, where, you know, we basically talk about if you're a man, what do you do in your daily life to avoid being victimized by rape or sexual assault? Right? Most men, it's nothing. It's not a daily concern that they think about. But when you ask women, what do you do in your daily life? A lot of women say, well, they don't go out at night or they don't go to certain areas of town or they, you know, um, I've even had ones where it's like, oh, you only get in on this side of your car. You don't park next to a van so they can't abduct you. You carry pepper spray with you. You know, you, you call someone on the phone, even though you're not actually on the phone, just to pretend you're on the phone to protect you from someone victimizing you. Like all sorts of things that women think of. Like I've heard students say they don't live on the first floor apartments because then someone can't break into their windows and assault them or all of these considerations that literally structure and frame the everyday experience of women in the culture. And especially the more marginal you are, right, the, the less social protections you have, the more likelihood that you can be victimized in such a way, right? So more and more marginalized communities face issues of, of rape and sexual assault. But again, the onus is always on protecting yourself on, on because of the rape myths in the culture, it's supposed to be on women to protect themselves instead of actually just teaching young men not to rape. We teach women all these ways to quote unquote, protect themselves from rape, or we deal with them once they have survived these brutal issues we don't really do a lot about prevention, right? Because that's going to take some societal work for us, right? Okay, so intimate partner violence. According to the World Health Organization, this is the greatest threat of violence to women worldwide. It's in their own homes. And of course, exact statistics are impossible because it's so underreported from both victims and institutions. So many incidents are dismissed as accidents, but all estimates have the prevalence of IPV show that it's much higher than reported cases. Roughly 1.5 million women and over 800,000 men are assaulted by an intimate partner annually in the U.S. Escaping abuse is much more difficult than most assume, as the structure is not really there to support victims in the long term, especially if they're men or from a same-sex couple. So power and perceived threats of dominance and authority underlie almost all acts of intimate partner violence. In my family violence course, I make students read a book called I Am Not Your Victim, where a survivor of IPV and sexual assault explains her experiences in excruciating details, where she initially tried to leave him, her mother and others told her that she's married and she needed to work it through their problems together as a couple. He was literally threatening her with guns, raping her, and even trying to force her hand down a garbage disposal. And some of her support system was like, work it out. So we judge women harshly when their relationships fall apart. 
And when children are involved, this is even more complicated. Though we no longer promote that women should stay in these relationships in the same way that we did generations ago, we now demonize women for not leaving or for not leaving as soon as we think they should leave from the privilege of not experiencing abuse or what we call coercive control, where abusers manipulate their victims. The reality is many women who are killed by their abuser are killed when they're trying to leave or after they have left which is why the shelter system was so essential to hiding women from their abusers who try to track them down and punish them for leaving. Women on average try to leave several times before they actually do. This shows how social workers, shelters, and other social support often fail to protect these women. Same with police. The woman in the book called the police when her abuser was outside her door with a loaded gun, and the cops said, call back if he gets in the apartment. He did get in the apartment, they struggled over the gun, and it was her that went to jail when the cops did finally arrive after a call of gunfire was called in from a neighbor. But her case was decades ago. We can look at more recent examples um, of Shauna Grice, who called police to report that her ex was stalking her and she was charged by police for wasting their time. Within a few months, she was dead at the hands of that ex-boyfriend and police were not held responsible for misconduct by ignoring and criminalizing her complaint. So this shows that while things are improving, especially in regards to the social acceptance of violence against women in relationships, there's still huge prejudicial issues affecting whether women get justice or not. And again, also when you look at the most marginalized communities, sexual violence is connected to social control. So the less privilege you have, financial privilege, the gender privilege, right? All of these different privileges, the less that you have, the more that it's easier to target and control you through this sexualized violence. And what we need to understand is how much our society and the values of our culture uphold these horrific things instead of calling them out for what they are and making sure that people are protected. <laughs>